second class of this week, and today we are going to talk about paleopathology. According to the International Journal of Paleopathology, paleopathology is the study and application of methods and techniques for investigating diseases and related conditions from skeletal and soft tissue remains. Basically, it's the study of physical remains, including osseous, dental and preserved soft tissues, for example, mummies. And the paleopathology aims to reconstruct health, disease and life histories in the past. In paleopathology, we can divide our study material in primary and secondary. In the primary materials, we are dealing directly with organisms that we want to study, for example, bones, teeth, preserved bodies and mummies. On the other hand, there are the secondary materials that can be documents, like historical and medical records, ethnographic representations, for example, paintings. And in this image here, this is a painting, a painting from an unknown artist that painted a portrait of a woman with a skin disease, as you can see here in the face of the woman. When we go to a museum, if we look to some paintings, there are a lot of diseases representations, and this can help to have information about the diseases that affected a population in a certain time. But we are going to focus this class in analyzing the bones. There are several methods to analyze the bones. We always start by simply looking at the bones, meaning making a macroscopic analysis with a detailed description of what we are seeing, and this is where we are going to focus. Then, depending on the lesions, other methods can be applied, like microscopic analysis that allows to see the lesions in more detail. And then there are also the radiologic and biomolecular methods. The radiologic are the ones that are used nowadays in medicine, and they give additional information about the lesions or allow to confirm a diagnosis. And finally, the biomolecular are used, for example, when there is evidence of an infectious disease, and sometimes it's possible to find the infectious agent in the bones. It's important to note that both the radiologic and biomolecular are expensive and destructive, so they are only used when it's really necessary. Now we will see the types of responses that the bone has to pathologies. The bone is considered to be monotonous because it only has two ways of responding, by forming and destructing bone. Some investigators consider a third response, that is bone formation and destruction at the same time. You can see in this image, this one here, this is a distal part of the humerus in a posterior view. And in this zones here, you can see the original bone. And then all of this in here is new bone formation. And this bone is very fragile, so a lot of times it just falls when we are handling the bones. And then in this image here, you can see this bone destruction, this holes in the vertebral body. And when we talk about bone destruction, it's important to distinguish between taphonomic damage. And how can we do this? When we are looking at the bones, as the taphonomic damage is made after the death of the individual, the bone is also dead. So the color of the margins are different from the rest of the bone. If you look here in this image, at this part, this margin of the bone, you see that is clearer than the rest of the bone. And with the taphonomic destruction, we have the pseudopathologies that basically mimic lesions but aren't real lesions. The responses of the bone can be reflected in abnormal size, abnormal form, abnormal bone formation, abnormal bone destruction, and abnormal bone density. It's very important to note the type, form, and pattern of localization of the lesions because this is important to the diagnosis of the diseases. Before we start to look at the lesions, there are two key concepts in paleopathology. And the first is a differential diagnosis, and it consists in making a wide range of possible diseases that can result in the lesions observed and eliminate those that for some reason cannot be the cause of the lesions. And to do this, it's necessary to see the type of bone responses, their distribution in the skeleton, look at the biological profile of the individuals, and also the era that he was alive. For example, if we have a differential diagnosis for a certain lesion, and one of the diseases only appear in children, 
and we are analyzing an adult, we can exclude these diseases as a possible diagnosis. Another thing about the differential diagnosis is that most of the times it's impossible to be certain about the disease that caused the lesions. It's better to have a wider differential diagnosis than to say that it's a, a specific disease without certainty. Only when there are pathognomonic lesions is that we can say with 100% certainty that the individual had a certain disease. And pathognomonic lesions are the ones that are, that are characteristic of a certain disease. And unfortunately, there are a few pathognomonic lesions. The second concept is osteological paradox, and it was introduced by Wood and collaborators in 1992. This paradox has some concepts that are discussed, but I will only tell you shortly what it is about. The identification of pathologies in skeletal remains is very complex and controversial because the marks of diseases are limited. So with this, the osteological paradox questions two things. If when we see lesions in an individual, was he less resistant because he developed the lesions, or was he more resistant because he survived the disease long enough to develop skeletal lesions? And on the other hand, when we don't see lesions in the skeleton of an individual, was he more resistant because he doesn't have lesions, or was he less resistant because he didn't survive long enough to develop skeletal lesions? So this tells us that we can't be sure if the presence of lesions indicates an individual that was less resistant, and that the absence of lesions indicates an individual that was more resistant. And this is very important to keep in mind when we are studying diseases in past populations. Now we are going to dive into the pathologies that can appear in the skeleton. It's kind of hard to put every pathology in a specific category, and there are different classifications for some diseases depending on the authors. But I will present you the categories that I was taught. So we have traumas, periosteal reactions and infectious diseases, physiological stress indicators, degenerative joint pathologies, degenerative non-joint pathologies and neoplasms. It's impossible to talk about all of them, so I will focus only on the traumas, periosteal and infectious diseases, and physiological stress indicators, because we don't have time for everything. But I will tell you shortly what are the others. The degenerative joint pathologies are also known as osteoarthritis, which are basically problems in the articulations that can result in bone growth, as you can see here in this image in this head of the humerus, and in most serious states, epanzebrunation, which is this part in here that you can see. And it has a porcelain appearance. Then, degenerative non-joint pathologies or enthesial changes are alterations in the areas of the muscle and tendons insertions, and this can provide information about the activity of the populations, once they are usually related to physical efforts, among other factors. In this image here, this is a ulna, and you can see here this grows, and this is not normal. This is an enthesial change. And this is usually related to fishing or using bows. And finally, we have the neoplasms that are the cancers. This can manifest by creating or destructing bone. In this image here, this is a humerus, and you can see here this grows, this gro bone growth. This is not normal. And then in this skull here, you can see these destructive lesions, and both of these cases are from neoplasms. Starting with the traumas, these are commonly found on human remains. And the trauma is a damage or injury inflicted on an organism that is locally produced, caused by a violent action. There are three concepts that are important when you talk about traumas, and they are antemortem, perimortem, and postmortem. Antemortem means that the event occurred before death, and we know this when there's bone reaction. And, we, and you can see here in this image, this zone was fractured, but you can see that the bone is together. So this means that there was bone remodeling here in this zone. So this new bone formation allowed for the bone to be together. 
and as there was bone remodeling, we know that this happened before death. The perimortem lesions are the ones that occur at the time of death, and the margins of the lesions are sharp and torn, with no color differences in the bone. Here you have a fibula, and these lesions here, they are perimortem, and you can see that the lines are sharp, and there are no differences in the color of the bone. And finally, post-mortem means that events occurred after the time of death. And it's important to know the characteristics of this to differentiate between perimortem and postmortem. In this case here, that is the same that I present to you, you can see that the margins have a regular outline and there are differences here in the color of the margins. There are several types of traumas and I will show you some of them, but first we are going to see the fractures and we are able to identify them by seeing different things. First, we know that a fracture happened when there's an alteration of the original form of the bone, as you can see here with this femur. And this happens because there was an immobilization of the bone, like we have today with the cast. We can also find the fracture line. This is a sacrum, you are seeing it in a posterior view, and this line in here, this is the fracture line. And then finally, the most frequently is to find a bone callus, which is this in here in this rib. And the bone callus is a connecting bridge that is formed during bone fracture repair. Other traumas can be intentional cultural modifications, as you can see here in the skull. This isn't the normal form of a skull. And we know that this was modified and this was made in some culture, cultures. Usually this, these modifications are done in childhood because it's the time where the skull is more elastic. Then we have trepanations, which are these holes in the skull that you can see. And they are considered to be the first kind of skull surgery. Then if you look, there are some parts here that we see some bone responding, which means that it was trying to close the hole when this individual died. So we know that this individual survived some time after this intervention. Some authors believe that these holes were made to release the demons that some people had, probably people with mental diseases. And lastly, another kind of trauma are the amputations. As you can see here, this is a ulna and a radio, and both of them were cut. And these are only some examples, but there are other types of traumas. Now we will talk about periosteal reactions and infectious diseases. First, the periosteal reactions, and as the name says, they are reactions of the periosteum. And the periosteum is a membrane made of connective tissue that surrounds all the bones except in the articulations. And this membrane has several functions like protecting the bones and producing new cells. And the periosteal reaction occurs as a response to pathological alterations and they consist in the deposition of new bone in the surface of the cortical bone. In the bones, we can observe two types of new bone. We have the woven bone, which is this one in here, this part, that indicates that the disease was active at the time of death, and it has a very disorganized aspect, as you can see. And then the lamellar bone, which is in here in this diaphysis. And the lamellar bone indicates that the disease was chronic or was in a phase of cure. And the lamellar bone results from the remodeling of the woven bone, and it is more organized. This kind of reaction was directly associated with infectious diseases during a lot of time. However, nowadays we don't make this assumption right away, because although infectious diseases can cause this reaction, other health conditions can also cause them. Here you have a list of what can cause periosteal reactions infectious, circulatory and metabolic diseases, neoplasms and traumas. When we find periosteal reactions, we can say if the disease was active or not at the time of death, and maybe say something about possible causes taking into consideration the distribution of the lesions.
Now we will be moving on to the infectious diseases and I will show you an example of periosteal reactions that can be related to tuberculosis. After the beginning of agriculture and the domestication of animals, there was an increase in the infectious diseases that affected the humans. And this is in short because of the vigor contact with the pathogens of the animals that started to infect the humans. So, before the antibiotics, infectious diseases was a really big problem in the societies. We are well aware of the great pandemics that caused millions of deaths, for example, the Black Plague. I'm going to present you three infectious diseases that caused a lot of deaths when they were active, and we are talking about tuberculosis, syphilis, and leprosy. And I chose these ones because, in my opinion, they are the ones with the most impressive bone lesions. I'm not going to explain how the infection occurs in humans in these diseases, but I left you links to videos or articles that explain it simply. So first we have tuberculosis, which is an infectious disease that affects mainly the lungs, but can also affect the skeleton. So in the skeleton, there are two main lesions that can be associated with tuberculosis. Periosteal reaction in the visceral face of the ribs and pot disease. In the ribs, the reaction occurs because as the lungs are infected, this infection can pass to the ribs, to the side that is in contact with the organs. And as you can see here in these two images, here you have periosteal reactions and here also periosteal reactions. And this is woven bone. And in the case of pot disease, which is this image in here, it's considered to be the bone tuberculosis and there's the collapse of the spine due to the destruction of the vertebral bodies. As you can see here in these images, these vertebral bodies here were, de were destructive, leading to the collapse of the column. Venereal syphilis is a chronic infectious disease that is characterized by three stages. In the last, that is the most serious phase, it can affect any part of the body. In the skeleton, it can create carish sica, and this is a pathognomonic lesion, which means that is characteristic of this disease. These lesions, the carish sica, occur only in the skull, and there is destruction and bone formation that leaves a scar. And you can see here, this, all these lesions, this is all carish sica. It's interesting that these lesions never make a complete hole in the skull, and they, and they don't cause the death of the individual, although they leave the people extremely disfigured. And another lesion that occurs frequently in cases of syphilis is the saber shins. And basically what's happen, what happens is that there's an accumulation of new bone here in the anterior surface of the tibia, as you can see here in this image. And the last infectious disease is leprosy. This is also a chronic infectious disease that can be either benign or malignant. This disease can affect the bones of the face and the hands and feet. In the face, there is a maxillary syndrome that is characterized by a large piriform aperture, as you can see here. Then the nasal bones become thick, sometimes can occur destruction of the nasal spine, as you can see also in this image. And finally, the reabsorption of the anterior maxillary, exposing the roots of the teeth, leading to its loss. And if you can see here in this zone, the alveolar margin is higher than in here. And also, this zone here, the bone is remodeled, which means that occurred antemortem tooth loss. And then, in the ends and feet, may occur the reabsorption of the phalanges, that result in the phalanges with the shape of shark teeth, as you can see in all these phalanges in this foot. Also, in the progression of the diseases, the phalanges can be lost. Finally, we are going to talk about physiological stress indicators. Physiological stress can be seen as a disturbance in the homeostasis of the body, and the homeostasis corresponds to the stability that the body needs to perform its functions properly. So in the skeleton, we have lesions that are considered physiological stress indicators, and their cause is hard to identify, and there is still discussion about this,
but they can be associated to the nutritional deficits, infectious diseases, neoplasms, circulatory and metabolic diseases. So, two of the stress indicators that we can see in the skeleton are the parotic hyperostosis and crevorbitalia. They are both forms of severe or mild porosity, but por the parotic hyperostosis is in the skull and the crevorbitalia in the roof of the orbits. In here, you have a skull of an unadult and you are seeing a severe case of parotic hyperostosis. On the other hand, this skull in here, you are seeing a mild case of, of parotic hyperostosis. And in here, you can see the crevorbitalia. Finally, in general, it is believed that this type of parotic lesions are a consequence of diet, infections, hygiene conditions and population density. If an individual presents these lesions, it can be said that he was suffering some type of stress. And we can apply this into a population. If a population presents a high frequency of individuals with this type of lesions, it can be said that the population was suffering some type of stress. It's important that you know that I present you extreme cases so that you can see clearly the lesions, but most of the times you don't have such easy cases to diagnose. I left you a book that is a photographic atlas of paleopathology if you want to see, and I want you to, to know that there's also oral pathology that I didn't talk in here. So if you have any questions, please let me know, and I will see you in the next class.